Hey, Yang Gang, as well as my original viewers. KMO here with another Out of My Head video, and today I am traveling by train, which is a fun thing to do, and it'll be the first time I've ever taken a train out of Bellows Falls. I've never taken one into Bellows Falls either. I'm always driving, whether I'm coming or going, but right now my truck's not working so well, so I am taking the train down to Lancaster, Pennsylvania, where I will be meeting with other people in the political organization uh, with for whom I do the weekly comic. It's called Geb, that's G-E-B-B, -B. Golf Echo Bravo Bravo, geb.io is the website, and it is a comic strip about a group of aliens who live under the ice in Antarctica. They kidnap people, they give them anal probes, but they think that doing so is a waste of time. They'd much rather do something more productive, but such decisions are above their pay grade. I hope you'll check it out. Uh, the comic strip is actually on hiatus for the next couple of weeks. We're going to go down there. I'm going down there. Everybody else is already there. And uh, we're going to strategize, and we're going to get the next dozen or so uh, strips scripted out in advance. So they hang together more as like a graphic novel rather than just one-offs that have a sort of cumulative story. And I know most of you watching this don't know what I'm talking about. So let me talk about something that you do know and care about. Andrew Yang and his 2020 presidential run. Um, I'm very excited about this, and I won't go off on a tangent to say why, because I really need to get things done, get this posted quickly, because I am hitting the road, or hitting the tracks, as it were, and I don't know that there will be Wi-Fi in the train. So, yesterday I was talking about human-centered capitalism, and one of the proposals that Andrew Yang has put forward on his website and in his book for making capitalism serve human needs rather than the needs of corporations and other institutions and abstract entities, or intersubjective entities, if you are a fan of uh, Yuval Noah Harari, is to take... Uh, a model that is already fairly successful in a few locations. It's called time banking. And basically, people just do things for one another in exchange for credits that are, you know, issued by the particular time bank in a, in a given region. So there is one in a town about a half hour, half hour south of where I live. The town is called Brattleboro, Vermont. And uh, they have a time bank system, which Andrew Yang actually specifically references in his book, The War on Normal People. Full title of which is The Truth About America's Disappearing Jobs and Why Universal Basic Income is Our Future. Now, one of the advantages that um, giving people just credit, abstract credit rather than dollars, is that we've all been conditioned by our vastly disparate income levels not to talk about money unless we know the person we're talking to very, very well. I really noticed this when I lived in New York City. I hung out with a lot of people who were artists and stage performers and burlesque performers and even some porn performers, and I'm going off on a weird direction. A lot of, uh, a lot of artist types, but also mixed in with the artist types are a lot of tech types and a lot of entrepreneurial types who like to hang out with artists. And I remember going to a party on a rooftop, you know, with a bunch of really cool people hanging out, and then I learned that the guy throwing the party actually owned the whole building you know, upon which the roof party took place. Um, but I would never know that from having talked to him for half an hour up there on the roof because we talked about pop culture and stuff. We've all learned that it's really uncomfortable to find out that the person that we're just hanging out with and talking to as if they are our equal makes a hundred times as much as we do. It's weird. So we train ourselves not to talk about it. But if we're both playing a game, you know, a new video game or some sort of card game or something, we'll have no reservations whatsoever about talking about scores. How many points did you score? You know, how did you do on this particular level? How did you adapt to that particular challenge? When it comes to if you turn economic activity into a game that doesn't have the same associations built into it that we have with money and income and talking about somebody else's wealth in comparison to yours, particularly when you don't know them very well, you just know them casually and socially, uh, all that drops away when you turn money into a game. To back this up, uh, I want to share a passage from Andrew Yang's book. And sorry for those of you who like to see the text of what I'm reading on screen, but since this isn't coming from Andrew Yang's website, it's coming from his book, uh, one, it wouldn't be as easy to grab the text, and two, it's, it's just a different animal. I'm not going there. But Andrew Yang writes, this is on page 194, Some might ask, why create a new digital currency instead of just using dollars? First, people will respond to points in a different way 
than they would if they were paid very low monetary amounts. If you tell me I'm getting $2 to do something, I may ignore it. But if it's 200 points, <laughs> I'll find it strangely compelling. People right now spend countless hours becoming Yelp elite, King Wazers, Mayors on Foursquare, Google Local Guides, and other online equivalents based upon points and social rewards. And one other thing that I want to mention is this. We've, I'm sure we've all heard, and if not, there's plenty to explore, about how social media, particularly Facebook, uh, but also to some degree Twitter and their you know, wannabe competitors, they have used the, the latest research on basically uh, behavioral reward hacking. You know, neurological rewards, dopamine feedback loops, basically using state-of-the-art knowledge on how our brains work to get us addicted to their services so that we're always, there's this little itch in the back of our brain to go and waste time and to engage in unhelpful and needlessly antagonistic social interactions on social media platforms. Those same techniques, which seem malevolent, can be put to good use. You can gamify the workplace, gamify money. What do I mean by gamify? It means use what we know about human psychology, human behavior, human neurology to induce a, um, a flow state. You know, the games that really suck up your time, if, if you have a gaming problem like I do, are ones where they structure the activity such that the time just flies by. You don't need to concentrate. You don't need to bring any will to the task of staying with that game. The game does that for you based on its structure. And you could structure work that way. Motivate people with points or some abstract, you know, digital currency this newly created digital currency, which is exchangeable for dollars, but which is also exchangeable just for other people's time, and which is also a social marker unto itself. It's a status marker that isn't associated with absolute wealth, which is something that would be really helpful because people will do stuff for status. They will keep playing games. They'll play role-playing games trying to get to a higher level. You know, they will play competitive games trying to get to a higher rank. People are motivated by these sorts of abstract rewards, those rewards can be structured not to keep people glued to social media, but to entice them to interact with other human beings in the real world engaging in pro-social activities, which is to say stuff that is good for our society, stuff that is good for us, stuff that really should be done, but which the market doesn't incentivize because it doesn't create profit for a corporation. We can, if we set up, we being, you know, <laughs> the United States government, basically, at the federal level, were to institute a national time bank and pay people in these abstract credits, which they can exchange with one another. And some businesses can choose to accept these credits as currency, or people can trade it in for actual currency. Um, basically, it's like printing a whole bunch of money, except not all of it's going to get converted into actual dollars. So... You know, while some portion of these abstract credits, which the government can create, you know, ad infinitum, some of them will get turned into dollars. Many, possibly most won't. Most will just circulate as, you know, in their existing form, which is great because what you want money to do is circulate through the economy. You don't want it to accumulate in the vaults of banks or, you know, in the bank accounts of extremely wealthy people, people who have more money than they could ever possibly spend, once, that, once they're just sitting on that money, that money's basically useless. So this is a topic on which I can get carried away and go off on a lot of tangents. And as I say, I have to travel today, so I'm going to leave it there. But uh, let me just say, thanks to all the new people who are subscribing, I'm very happy to have found the candidacy of Andrew Yang, not only because... I support what he supports, and I'm really encouraged to hear a presidential candidate speaking intelligently on the topics of artificial intelligence and automation and their effects on the economy, but also because he's got this, this wealth of policy positions on his website for me to dig into and talk about. This is stuff that I really enjoy talking about, and I'm glad that you're here to listen to me talk about it. So uh, I will be on a train all day today. I will have lots of time for reading comments, so do comment below, and I will talk to you again tomorrow.